Um, today, what I want to do is, or what Rory and I want to do, we'll do a double header and we want to talk to you today about aerial survey and crop marks um, and some recent work we've done to review schedule monuments in the Tafak area, or crop marked schedule monuments in the Tafak area. So I'm going to start today um, by giving a general introduction overview of crop marks and crop marks in Scotland in general. talk more specifically about what we want to review the crop marks in the area that are scheduled in the area. So I want to just start by giving you a look at crop archaeology. You may be very familiar with this. Um, you who are less familiar, um, what we do is just give you a bit of general marks, but we record them. I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, but for those who are less familiar, um, crop marks reveal tend generally reveal archaeology that is on a whole, otherwise invisible. So either because banks and wall or walls have been ploughed flat, um, ditches and filled, or because the material used in their construction, such as uh, wood, just doesn't survive. You have the microphone upside down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so crop marks reveal archaeology that's otherwise um, invisible, um, either because of the been plowed leveled or or um, or because of the materials used in the construction just as But what does it have to do? are the very remains of these features? So Soil. So these are things like people have built and elements of the right house. The conditions are right, and these are the types of things that you can do across the world. And I think I'm on the bottom left here, and it's an overview of the type of soil. So, features like pits and ditches tend to hold mo more moisture and nutrients. Crops will root deeper in these features and in certain circumstances will grow better and taller and will ripen more slowly. Compact features like wall foundations will have the opposite effect. Now these effects uh, create colour and height differences and differences in the rate of ripening in the crops above these features. So essentially archaeological crop marks have visible differences in the growth and ripening of crops above ground caused by buried archaeological features below the ground. And we record these features from the air, usually from light aircraft. And you can see um, aerial survey in progress on the bottom right uh, of this image uh, and the aircraft itself that we use on the top right. And the colour differences and patterns that we record in crops can be interpreted as archaeological sites and features. Now, aerial survey and the recording of crop marks has a long history in Scotland, starting with aerial reconnaissance by OGS Crawford in the 1930s and followed by J.K. St. Joseph flying from Cambridge during and after the Second World War. Most of these flights were focused on looking for Roman remains, though they did record archaeological sites of all different dates and periods. But it was in 1970 that the aerial survey really took off in more ways than one, with the initiation of a flying coat program by the Royal Commission on the Ancient Historical Monuments of Scotland, which is one of the predecessor bodies of HGS. And those first few years produced a real bonanza of new and previously unknown sites. This flying programme is now operated by Historic Environment Scotland and has run every year since 1976, stopped only by the pandemic. And it's not just the Royal Commission and HES that have added to this record. There have also been a, a number of independent over, over the years who have added to So what is the perspective of crops done for us? How does it add to our knowledge of Scotland? Why should we pay attention to this way? Why do you think? Most fundamental marks of the identify and record archaeological sites. No way of knowing sites. Sites crop marks of elements of the ground. Now that's not universal. In some cases, there are features, but there's a lot of identified sites. Crop marks archaeological remains that would be otherwise be invisible and unknown. And that's shown by this photograph of a prehistoric site being surveyed in Dumfries and Galloway. In this photograph, we're surveying the location of a Neolithic timber circle. And this is a monument type that was built of upright timbers. The timber has long since decayed and there's nothing to be seen on the ground. But what does survive are the infilled posts below the ground. 
and they've been recorded on aerial photographs as darker marks in the crop. On the left is interpretation of the features revealed as crop marks, the timber circle at the, very at the very bottom of the image. In fact, we know that at this site, there's a whole complex of sites in this field. But without aerial photographs, we wouldn't have a clue the site even existed. We wouldn't know about it at all. So crop marks reveal an otherwise invisible archaeology. Now, the flying and recording of these sites from the air has added extensively to the archaeological record, and we now have more than 9,000 crop mark sites in the National Record of Historic Environment. These sites cover a whole range of archaeology, um, from short stretches of ditch to complexes of features like extensive prehistoric settlements, to cult cultivation remains, to complex hill forts. And on the left, you can see a map of all the locations of all the crop mark uh, records that we hold in the National Record of Historic Environment. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. Um, and the records tend towards the eastern and southern parts of the country. Now that's because uh, crop marks form in growing crops. Um, cereal crops are the most sensitive to buried remains, and so we tend to identify archaeological crop marks in the regions of the countries that grow cereal crops, that's largely the lowlands of Scotland, but also in the parts of the country that are relatively drier, which is one of the main conditions we need for the crop marks to form. The areas of which we have recorded crop marks include some of the most intensively cultivated areas of Scotland, generally the lowland areas of Scotland. So crop marks have revealed this lowland archaeology. And there are some archaeological sites that are wholly or almost wholly known from crop marks. And a good example of this are Cursus monuments. These are Neolithic monuments, if you don't know, um, which are long linear enclosures defined either by lines of posts or banks and ditches. On top left, you can see um, in the red dots uh, the locations of all known Cursus monuments in Scotland. And we've got a good, good scattering of these, these monuments across the country. But if we remove all of those that were first recorded as crop marks, we are left with only four such monuments. So one of these, um, the one um, in south, southern Scotland around Bigger has got two dots, but it's just the one monument because we've got, two, we've got uh, a record for each end of it. So we only know of four, so four monuments, uh, such Cursus monuments. Uh, we would, we'd only know of four such Cursus monuments without crop marks. Of those four, one was identified through excavation and the remaining three are ditch-defined examples. So without crop market evidence, we would know far fewer of these Cursus monuments and possibly would interpreting them as odd, and very rare monuments that we would potentially find very difficult to explain. So if we begin to move a little closer to home, this now begins to suggest something about the impact of crop marks of our understanding on the, on, um, the archaeology of Scotland and of the Tafak region. Let's do that. Let's just move a little closer to home. Um, here we can see the extent of the archaeological records as extracted from the National Record of Historic Environment in the Tafak area. In red are all the archaeological sites recorded as crop marks. In black are the non-crop non, non mark archaeological sites. And even visually, I hope you can see that the sites recorded as crop marks form a significant portion of archaeological knowledge in this area. Around 18% of the National Record of Historic Environment records in the Tafak area are crop marked, so were first recorded as crop marks. That's just over 3,000 sites. But if you bear in mind that crop marks are largely recorded in the crop growing predominantly lowland areas, in those lowland parts of the region, that percentage would be quite a lot higher, and in some parts, the greater proportion of the known sites are from crop marks. So in numbers alone, crop marks have done a lot for us. They've revealed an otherwise invisible lowland archaeology, filling in large parts of the landscape with archaeological sites. Talking about crop marks, one idea that's sort of thrown around is that because crop marks are in land, it has to be under cultivation, they're all being ploughed away and are being actively damaged. Now, undoubtedly, some of the sites are being affected by cultivation, but that picture is much more complex than that, and many are stable with the soil, others may be given an element of protection um, under some conditions. Now, one of the reasons we know that the case is because we do record the same site many years apart and in such um, cases. An example um, here on the left, we have the site of a square barrow at West of Denhead near Cooper Angus, which was first recorded in 1977, recorded again in 1992, as you can see on the screen, and recorded again this year. That's a crop mark site that's been known and repeatedly recorded for, over, or for more than 45 years. On the right is a possible henge at Balmacombe Farm near King's Kettle and Fife. This one was first recorded in 1983 and had been recorded again on several occasions over the intervening years, including 1993, as you see here, 
and it was recorded in the next year. This tells us that these sites still exist despite an agricultural land and from the Mark Evans at least not much has seem, seems to have changed over the years. And when we're doing crop marks, also bear in mind that the way in which these crop marks show to us, the way we record them, with clearly marks are quite fuzzy, uh, tells us very little about the condition of archaeological features below the ground. So many factors including uh, weather pattern, uh, type of crop, irrigation, farming methods, or the time at which we record uh, of the the time at which the photograph of the image of uh, the crop mark was taken, all of these factors and many more influence how crop marks form, or the way in which crop marks form, what they look like from the air. So because we're the we're crop marks are affected by so many different factors, we can infer uh, very little of the condition from what they look like year and year on aerial photographs. We do know um, though that crop marks tend to show the larger features of a site and excavation more often than not reveals extra detail. So the crop marks that we record are generally only the highlights of an archaeological site and more often than not we can expect the sites that, um, that, tell, us, uh, that uh, tell us, give us more detail when they're investigated. And we saw that from this morning, from this, the first talk this morning at Meagle, which was a, a crop mark site uh, which showed, when on excavation, it showed, um, showed extensive detail. And these are just a couple of examples on the screen of, of sites that um, under excavation, um, which can give given us a lot more information than we would have necessarily, um, or we would have uh, derived um, simply from, from crop marks. But the crop marks give us those highlights about the archaeological sites and tell us that there's something important, something below the plough soil. Um, so now I'll pass on to Rory. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, I'm kind of slightly because the, the, the title is what crop marks ever done for us, and I'm kind of going with what have we ever done for crop marks. Um, and a, a couple of little points. I'm sure some of you sitting out there are going, "What's a designations team? Um, what's a senior designations officer?" Essentially, it's a protected place. In Scotland, there's five main ones, five nationally important types. Schedule monuments, which are the archaeological sites, listed buildings, which are buildings, uh, gardens design, designed landscapes, battlefields, and uh, historic marine protected areas, shipwrecks. So we've got, um, and we do this under the auspices, we protect them under the auspices of a piece of legislation called the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act. And under the Act, Historic Environment Scotland has a duty to uh, compile and maintain a schedule of nationally important monuments. And a schedule is just a fancy word for a list, but that's where the title scheduled monuments comes from, because they're on this list. And so in the kind of top of here, you can see, there we go, we've got a not far off 1,300 out of a total of 8,070 scheduled monuments. Uh, that number fluctuates every year because we add some, we take some away uh, and it's about 16% of the national total. Of that, as you can see here, 460 of them we only know through crop marking. So that's a big percentage of those nationally important sites and that is um, uh, that, we, that we wouldn't know about those without aerial, aerial survey um, revealing these crop marked sites. And when I, I say nationally important, that's the only criterion for a scheduled monument, which we like a lot because it's quite vague, and so we can fit lots of things in there. Um, if, I'm, if I'm honest, I could give a whole other talk on how we schedule things, although not at the time of day, I suspect. It would, you know. Many of the sites that are in, on the schedule that are crop marked were added in the 1990s or the early 2000s. Uh, we recognized that there were a whole host of lowland archaeological sites that were not really important, that weren't on the schedule, weren't protected as scheduled monuments. So we went through a period where we added lots of them, such as this example here, uh, where you can see the nice um, enclosed settlement, big souterrain at the top. Um, this site, 
in, in Perth and Ross, um, Green of Inverme, which actually is an interesting one. We scheduled it as a prehistoric settlement. And when the uh, surf project excavated it, we found it actually was, they found it was medieval. So we have since updated our documentation. Every scheduled monument has a document which gives you a map showing where it is. And, and, and in theory, some information about where it, about what it is and why it's important. However, we've been doing this since uh, 1882. So we have uh, a, a lot of scheduled monuments that are, are very old and don't have um, documentation which would meet our kind of modern standard. And that's important because scheduled monuments are um, they're the top of the tree when it comes to protected sites. They trump every other type of heritage designation, even world heritage sites, um, with the level of protection they have. They're the most protected sites in the UK. Um, and if you were to do works to one of those without scheduled monument consent, you could find yourself in court. Uh, unauthorised works or damage to scheduled monument, you can't have if we took you to court and prosecuted you, you could have an unlimited fine and up to two years in prison. So our team, the designations team, who maintains the, the schedule, the list, one of our really important jobs is to make sure that the documentation is up to date and that everybody who uses the land, because these stay on, you know, they're still in private ownership when they're scheduled, uh, there's no rights of access that can't be visited or any of those things. They are still on the landowner's land. They go into their deeds as a burden. It's important that they know that it's there and they know what it is and why it's important. So as part of our maintain, we do projects. So we did a project recently, uh, which was on our site in this area. You can see we chose our corridor between our broth and the side of Octorada. Partly we did it because there was a lot of crop sites, so 219, which is a good, ex a good percentage of the, I think it's about 1,200 exactly, that are scheduled. And there was a whole, those are the reasons, the other reasons we picked. Essentially, a good sample, lots of uh, sites we could extrapolate from, when we're doing this, and it's in an area where management of land and scheduled monuments that are crop marked, which are invisible, can cause, is can cause um, issues uh, for land managers. So what did we do? Well, we did three things. Um, we left some of them alone, such as this. It's an unenclosed settlement. Um, probably see it in the center of the screen. Well, yeah, it's working. Center of the screen there. There's some souterrains, some roundhouses. And as Kirsty said, there's probably lots of features we can't see there. So it's probably far more extensive than what the, the crop marked archaeology shows us. Some sites which the documentation was very old for and we had uh, new information for. We updated the scheduling. Here's for TV, uh, where there have you know, been extensive art, um, excavations. And I think that that image it's quite interesting because you can see different crops. Uh, you can see the crop marks in this field, but here you can't see anything. Um, so we, we updated our records. And for some, some sites we made them um, a fond farewell from the schedule. We didn't think, the, the, some of them we, we knew were archeology span and potentially important, we couldn't actually put our finger on what they might have been. So this one, uh, um, at BMV, originally scheduled as a prehistoric settlement, you can maybe see there's a corner of a ditch that here, and there is another a little bit in there. It's a, is it a prehistoric rectilinear enclosure? Is it a enclosure to do with the church, which is up here? Is it field boundary? We didn't know. So that's the kind of site, the one we're reviewing them, if we can't actually say what it is, it's very hard to make an argument that it can be nationally important. So you know, we, we, take, we took it off the schedule, um, which I say is not to say we don't recognize that it's archeology span and um, 
someone could come along and excavate that and show us it's you know the most important site ever. But uh, we have to go with uh, analysing what we can from aerial photos, extrapolating from excavations from similar sites, and and looking at uh, the record as a whole. And there were a few such as this one, which was scheduled as a, an unenclosed settlement. Um, you can probably see here, we thought this was a roundhouse. Uh, when we had a look at the historic mapping as part of the project, we spotted that there was this roundel feature. And now the historic mapping is now on our GIS, or com our computer mapping system, so it's far easier for us to access the historic mapping than it was back when this was originally scheduled. But it's pretty clear that from what we're looking at, that's in exactly the same spot as the landscape feature was. So the chances are it's really not a, a prehistoric settlement. So again, kind of site we take off, off the schedule. Um, and this is a, a, a map just kind of showing what we ended up doing. And the green dots are the ones we left alone. We decided we weren't going to do anything with them. The yellow dots are the ones we changed and the red dots are the ones we took off. So you can see we actually removed, and you can see from the numbers, um, we actually did remove quite a few scheduled monuments as part of our project. But that's only one little part of, what, uh, of, of where we are. And in this area there are, as you can see, another 133 crop marked sites in Perth and Kinross. 74 and Fife, and 148 in Angus that we still need to look at. Uh, and we will get, we will, um, we will in, over time be looking at these. Um, so that kind of brings us probably, brings me back to the original question. Well, what, what do crop marks do for us? Well, for me, they keep me in a job. So that's, you know, that and, and other nationally important sites. So that's good. Um, as Kirsty said, the, the presence of these sites and the, the ability to see them through aerial photography has transformed our understanding of, of lowland Scotland. Without them, we would be um, kind of scratching our heads and thinking, well, I'm not really sure what happened there. There's whole hosts of sites. Kirsty um, pointed out Cursuses, but other sites as well. Um, henges, square borrows, uh, timber monuments, which are Kirsty's speci speciality. You know, we wouldn't actually know you know, Neolithic timber monuments. We wouldn't know any of them. We wouldn't think they existed. So definitely transformed our understanding of Scotland's archaeology. It, and that understanding has given us the sort of confidence to realize that there are actually a great large number of nationally important sites which only survive as buried archaeological features. Um, and as Kirsty said, it doesn't mean there have been out, even though they're in agricultural land. Some of them, definitely. And there, are, there is another whole talk we could do about, you know, why we schedule stuff that's still underneath the plough. But I'm going to step away from that. Um, so, yeah, these, these crop mark sites, have have, they have transformed our knowledge. They've, they've broadened our knowledge. And, and we find new ones every year when we're doing our aerial survey. And I think, I guess what Kirsty and I hear is basically saying, yeah, let's love them. Because we know archaeologically people think they're a different beast than other sites, but they're just the same. They're just as important. So love your crop marked sites is what I say. <laughs> um, thanks for listening.